Well, hello there. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. We're delighted that you're able to join us for this, uh, this second update on the Research Consortium for School Health and Nutrition. And we're going to focus on sharing best practices to strengthen the quality of school meals programs. My name's Donald Bundy, and I'm uh, I'm uh, uh, part of the team that's co-created this uh, this event. And the important other half of the team, I'm going to just hand over to now, Bibi Giosi. Bibi. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us uh, today for the second day of the Research Consortium. I am uh, Bitepo Giosi, known as Bibi, Senior Advisor to AUDA NEPAD CEO on Nutrition and Food Systems. Uh, before I hand over back to Don, let me just uh, recap a little bit of what that transpired yesterday so that we can have a continuum of thought and thread. We talked about, or rather the speakers talked about the four benefits of school meals programs globally, meaning, or that is education, social protection, health and nutrition, as well as agriculture. And then we acknowledge the importance of the first thousand days while also giving a focus on the following or next 7,000 days, which are the school years. Then we also focused on the importance of uh, budget impact analysis and cost of effectiveness of programs while adopting a multi-sectoral lens and a multi-sectoral approach and integration of programs to be holistic in the delivery approach, that's implementation science. Then we also looked at uh, the integration of other health issues such as um, helminthes, schistosomiasis, eye health, amongst others. Last but not least, we also appreciated the need for value for money best across the sectors. So those were the issues we covered. I hope they set the stage for coming back today to continue our dialogue. Over to you, Don. Great, thank you, Bibi. And I, I have to say the message I took away that I liked most was from Michael Kramer, the Nobel uh, Economics Laureate, who said that the in the program they looked at in Kenya, school health program it looked in Kenya, the because the children did better with better school health programs and grew up, so this is a 20 year follow-up study, grew up, got better jobs, the more the, the tax they paid, just the tax they paid as a result of the better jobs paid for the whole program. So this is really evidence now that these things are an investment. So that was a, that was a very good story. We're gonna get into some more detail today. Um, You'll remember that we're working with a coalition of 73 countries that created this, uh, uh, this uh, area of work, and they asked for the creation of a research consortium to support them in terms of evidence and in terms of guidance. The, the, we're showing you a figure here just to say, you know, there's the 73 countries that are the boss, they make the decisions. We have a small secretariat at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, but all the work is done globally through a series of communities of practice. Bibi, do you want to talk about the, those pra practice communities a bit? Absolutely. Thank you, Don. Uh, yesterday, we started to cover or look at the four communities of practice, plus the two that have been recently created. The first one is on analytics and metrics. Of course, that's where we look at value for money and look at other work that has been done before to buttress what we are intending to do. The second one, of course, as I mentioned, the 7,000 days is very important. So nutrition measurement becomes very critical for us to look at indicators around what we should be measuring very appropriately. Then, of course, we can't do it without impact and evidence. Are we doing the right thing at the right time for the right audience and for the right outcome and impact? Then we are looking at the early career and youth um, networks and developments. Then good examples. What are those examples or nuggets we can pick from different countries looking at the school health and nutrition programs. And then last but not least, diet and food systems. Very critical because now we are moving beyond just filling the belly of a child, but looking at really nourishing the brain, the physique and the development of that child. So these are the four communities of practice and we shall be continuing to look at this. But let's not forget that we have other sessions that are actually tying very well to this session. Don, want to comment on this? Okay, so so um, so as Bibi's pointing out, we have the two updates on the research consortium. This is the second of two of the two. If you missed the first one, it's it's recorded. Um, 
uh, going to the next slide, this just shows there are some other events that are really great uh, that we feel that we want to encourage you to, uh, to, to really follow up on. Um, we've, we've listing listing them here so you can look these up on uh, on on the website um because we we think that the it, the events that are coming up tomorrow we've got uh, um one that's around uh, biodiversity one that's around youth and one that's around bond kids the new nutrition focus um and then on friday we're going to hear from the two uh, initi two other initiatives. Research Consortium is one of the initiatives, but there's two others for the co for the coalition, one on data and monitoring and one on sustainable financing. So, so do try and take these in. This is a great week, actually. It's been very exciting and the, the uh, School Meals Coalition has done a great job of, of, of pulling these uh, sessions together. But I also wanted to just uh, highlight the fact that one of the things we've done is create a, a new statement of the main insights that have been gained over the course of the last year the coalition was created a year ago um, almost almost to the day and and here's the insights that we've listed the insights in a statement that's on the um on our website and we would love to hear from you any thoughts you have on that any feedback on that because next week that's going to be discussed it's going to be the the anchor document for the discussions in Helsinki by the ministerial uh, the ministerial meeting. Um, so that'll be a, a follow up. But please send us any feedback on that because we we really want to co-create these documents. We want to work together um, on, on that. OK, that's our introduction. Bibi, let's get into the, 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 the work of the session. Thank you, Don. And additionally, participants, ladies and gentlemen, do not forget to put your questions in the chat box and Q&A so that uh, the uh, speakers can adequately respond to, to your queries and concerns. Now, we have a very great lineup of speakers just like yesterday, and I would love to, it is my pleasure and very much honor to introduce our Professor Elizabeth Betsy Christiansen, who is the professor at the University of Ottawa and is the chair of our Impact and Evidence Community of Practice. And she is going to be talking to us today about her ongoing Cochrane systematic reviews of school meals on the physical and psychosocial health of school children experiencing socioeconomic disadvantages. Without further ado, over to you, Betsy. Welcome. The floor is yours. Okay. Thank you so much, Bibi. Um, first of all, I, I am glad to be here. This is a great event. And um, and I'm excited about it. So I'm here to tell you just a little bit about the school feeding program review. Um, and then you can actually review the protocol. Uh, we have the um, URL on the slides. And also, I think it's being sent out to you. And so I first want to say that this review involves 16 people, seven in our working group, and then um, 11, no, nine other investigators. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so what do we want to do? Well, first of all, and the main objective is to assess how effective school meals are for, um, for improving physical and psycho psychosocial health of children and youth. And we're interested in all countries in the world in LMIC, as well as high income and middle income countries. And we're also interested in the equity question. Do school meals um, work as well or better for children in living in disadvantaged socioeconomic circumstances as, as it does for those who work, who live in more advantaged circumstances? And then we also are conducting a realist review to understand which factors in the context and implementation impacted on success or failure. Um, you know, things like calories given, type of food, um, who was monitoring, how the parents reacted. Did they substitute food, the school meals for food at home? Okay, and then finally, we want to gather data that's useful for cost benefit analysis. Next slide, please. Okay, so who is eligible? Who is the population we're looking at? We are looking at school-aged children 
most of whom are living in deprived socioeconomic circumstances. And in lower and middle income countries, that is any, any school that's in rural or 40% um, of the children in the study are urban, but low SES. In higher income countries, that goes up to 60% low SES, or um, they're living in a low income neighborhood. One, one older study described his breakfast program as in a ghetto. Um, and the intervention that we're interested in is school meals, snacks and meals, and or take home rations. And we're comparing it to um, no treatment or a low protein placebo. So they cannot have meals. Control group, okay, now the next slide. Okay, so we have made some progress, although it's been tough. Um, we have published the protocol and I would like you all to read it and to comment on it. And we have searched all literature from the inception, that means from the beginning of database. And we have one included study that's from 1911. Um, so we are definitely going to scour the literature. And we have, our first search yielded over 40,000 records. Um, then we screened them by title and abstract. That means that we looked at the title and sometimes you can tell by the title. If, for example, if it said um, feeding iguanas, you know that it's not anything you want. Um, and we, we also sometimes look at the abstract for that. And we can sometimes tell whether it's um, not relevant or not. But those that look relevant were sent for full text screening. And that means our team reads the whole text, the whole paper. So far, we have 244 excluded studies and 61 included papers. Now that doesn't mean included studies. Some studies publish um, you know, four or five papers. So I would say it probably is about 45 or 50 studies, which is pretty good. And we have 73 left to find and complete. Most of them are older um, and in obscure journals, but we are trying to track them down. Okay, now what do we know about the included studies? 30% of them are our randomized control trial, and they're in countries such as Kenya, Uganda, Ghana, Burkina Faso, Senegal, India, Argentina, Jamaica, Cambodia, China, New Zealand, the United Kingdom, and the United States. So um, that is our progress that far, and we are working very, very hard on to get this out. Okay. Um, You, you're handing back, Betsy? Yes, I'm handing it back. All ah, right, that's great. Thank you so much for, for doing that. Can I also say Betsy was the person who did the, the first ever uh, Cochrane systematic review of school meals back in 2007. Um, and so this is, uh, this is another look uh, now with a much bigger team, uh, with a, a global team, mm -hmm. and uh, very exciting. And we're very interested in how these results are gonna turn out. Everyone who's on this call, Please, please have a look at the protocol that's been published. Give us give us guidance on uh, how to move forward with this. We'll be uh, just. I mean, I think the right thing to say at this stage is watch this space as we uh, <laughs> as you'll be coming up with some uh, great and great new findings, and we'll have certainly the best, uh, the most complete uh, set of studies uh, uh, globally on school meals in low income countries. Okay, so the. Um, Thank you for that. And um, now we're going to move on to a, another community of practice. And this is the, the community of practice of analytics and metrics. We heard from one of the co-chairs yesterday, Stefan Verge. Today, we're going to hear from another of the co-chairs. That's uh, Noam Angrist, um, who works with uh, uh, at Oxford, at the World Bank, and also in Botswana. So can we, uh, can, and I think uh, he, he's provided us with a video um, because he's in a board meeting at, at this moment. So let's go ahead with that.
sorry, can I just check if you can hear that? No, we yeah. can't hear the voice, no. Nope. Right. Okay. Dive right in and share my screen. Uh, wonderful. So today I'm going to talk about learning adjusted years of schooling, uh, a new measure in global education, and it's relevant to school health and nutrition interventions. So why learning adjusted years of schooling, or LAYS for short? The typical education measure in education for, for many years has been schooling. But there's a lot of growing evidence that schooling is not necessarily the same as learning. This was an assumption you'd be in school and you learn kind of year on year. What you see here in this figure is while schooling rates have gone up all over the world over the last 10, 20 years, uh, learning on the right hand side is pretty flat, low and stagnant. So this is based on some new global data on learning worldwide that we recently published in Nature, uh, really showing this stagnation and, and this learning crisis, really. Uh, and so LAYS adjust schooling for learning. So it doesn't just assume that schooling will translate into learning, and it really explicitly captures both. So how does this work? So one thing you can see here, for example, if you look at a country, let's say Korea, and you look at the actual years of schooling, about 15 years of schooling, and then you adjust for the quality of learning, it's pretty high in, in South Korea. And so you can see the discount is very small. But if you look, look at another country like South Africa, you can see average years of schooling is just under 12 years. But if you account for the quality of that schooling, it's about half of what you're getting in a country like South Korea in terms of what kids are learning. So you see a big discount there, uh, cut almost in half to six years of learning adjusted years of schooling. So one way of thinking about this is kind of the productivity of schooling. How much learning are you getting for each year of, of schooling? And another way of thinking about this is kind of like an exchange rate. So just like one year is not worth the same or where one dollar is not worth the same as one piss. So one year of schooling is not worth the same learning uh, across countries. So by accounting mm -hmm. for both of these, you get something a bit more comparable. The calculation itself is very simple. You're taking the years of schooling multiplied by learning in a given country relative to learning in a high performing country or sort of a benchmark for high performance. Uh, you could pick kind of high performance as uh, articulated in PISA or TIMS. Uh, there's many ways to do this and the methodology is described in, in a paper cited below there uh, with, with a series of co-authors. So what are some of the benefits of LAYS? It captures learning as well as schooling and we know both matter. It's a unified scale to make cost effectiveness trade-offs similar in some ways to qualies and, and dollies in public health. It's easy to understand and interpret and it's actionable. It demonstrates where governments can act. So sometimes we have these indicators which have 50 ingredients and then it's very unclear which thing you can actually improve to improve the, the, the unit. Here you have just two ingredients, schooling and learning. So it's very transparent and actionable. It's incentive compatible. So if you just incentivize schooling, governments might get kids into school, but not focus so much on learning. Vice versa, if you just focus on learning, you just use assessments like PISA and TIMS, uh, then kids might actually be incentivized to not go to school so that the kids who show up are those that are high performing. So you actually want both schooling and learning. And it's been adopted as an education measure by a series of institutions, including the World Bank, FCDO, and USAID, and, and a growing community is really using this more and more. The other benefits of LAYS are education measures like this are really quantifiable in terms of their returns, and the returns are really high. So, for example, for a typical year of school, you're getting about 10% return to your, your wage, and so you're getting a lot of these easy-to-quantify returns and return on investment calculations. So I've gone and shown you a bit of country level lays. Now I want to show you some lays at the intervention and policy level. And this is another paper. This has kind of been a series of papers to pull this effort together. So we look at over 150 studies across 46 developing countries. This is a map of the number of impact evaluations per country. You can see a fairly wide spread across a series of countries. And here's the bottom line in terms of cost effectiveness. So we look at both effectiveness and cost. And so this is learning adjusted years of schooling gained for $100 spent. So you can see some things like interventions to teaching uh, at the level of the child rather than age or grade, teaching at the right level of a fairly well-known education intervention now is delivering about three lays per $100 spent. And so if you recall some of those gaps that I was showing before, like in South Africa, that was kind of a six, discount factor of, of lays, this is closing half of that gap. So these are really sizable gains for $100 spent. 
Uh, so that's one example of a, a highly cost-effective intervention. On the flip side, some very popular education interventions are not very effective at all. And so you're seeing interventions like general skills teacher training, one of the most popular interventions about zero ways gain. And so there's huge returns to really making these trade-offs and comparisons and thinking about how to really use limited resources to make the most efficient investments possible for, for governments and, and multilaterals and so forth. Now into this effort, and this has been a key part of our work as the, as the consortium, is now adding some more health and school-based health interventions into this comparison. We had a few before, and now we're adding more, uh, including school feeding, uh, malaria prevention, deworming, and, and so forth. I'm going to share a snapshot of some early analysis we've done on the malaria side, and we're also doing this on school feeding and, and school meals. So here's a bit of what we're seeing on malaria prevention. So we've aggregated a bunch of the uh, malaria prevention studies. Uh, and we've seen what the effect is on, on learning outcomes and, and schooling outcomes as well. So what you can see here are two categories. You can see a subsample on the left here uh, for those that are evaluating effectiveness on some measures of learning like cognition, so kind of early measures of cognition. Uh, so not necessarily literacy and numeracy, but still a, a cognitive skill and sort of a, a, a leading indicator of literacy and numeracy. And then we also have the fuller set of interventions for all uh, education outcomes on the right side. So this is the same category of intervention, but kind of broadening out the, the outcomes. And what you can essentially see here is that this school-based health intervention or, or health intervention, sometimes it's out of school, sometimes in school, uh, is extremely cost-effective in terms of education outcomes, even though it's not an education intervention. As you can see, it's getting you about 10 learning adjusted years of schooling for $100, partially because it's so cheap. So it's moderately effective, but extremely cheap. And so you're getting these really high returns per $100. So I think this makes the point that to improve education, uh, health is, can be really critical. And we're now doing this for school meals as well. So stay tuned for those results. And, and also these will be out uh, very soon. This is a sneak peek. So I'm just going to wrap up and, and share that this measure of learning adjusted years of schooling has really uh, started to influence the discourse. It's a core part of the human capital index, it's the education pillar of the World Bank's human capital index. And it's also being used in a new effort called the Global Education Evidence Advisory Panel, which is an effort to review the evidence in education and make recommendations on cost effective investments. Uh, and this is co-convened by a series of institutions like the World Bank FCDO. USAID and, and UNICEF and growing the whole B squared group as well, which is a, a donor collaborative. So I'll just wrap up here. Uh, thanks very much and, and great to be here. Thank you very much, Noam, for this uh, very interesting new metrics. And I must say it is quite an eye opener because when you really think about it, you know, how many times do we think about schooling as not equal to learning? Very few times. And so I think uh, one can also just you know, extend this to say, how many times do we think about the difference between traditional knowledge systems and the modern knowledge systems? Because I think we should really be moving towards, not just talking about classroom learning, but other forms of learning. And that said, I think I very much liked your, how you look at the full gamut you know, of the health and other interventions you know, as very cost effective and how we can actually bring this to the fore in how we now talk about the overall investment, the overall impacts and the overall outcomes in this. So I hope there won't be any more naysayers to say schools as an environment and school meals don't have any positive value. So once again, thank you very much, Noam. Now moving right along, now, now we are going to be hearing from two people about how to respond at the scale of the problem. And then yesterday we heard about the vision and, and cystosomiasis in schools. And today we will focus on malaria and NTDs. These are the, the neglected tropical diseases. It's not neural tube defects. In fact, each time I see NTDs, I think neural tube defects as a nutritionist, of course. But these are neglected tropical diseases. So, let me introduce um, Dr. Arnold, Donald Apart, another Donald, the case of two Donalds here. Um, I'm Ref Health Africa to talk about how malaria is being managed in schools across the continent. Over to you, Dr. Apart. 
You have the floor. Uh, thank you, thank you, Bibi. And uh, uh, on my behalf, and uh, on behalf of AMREF Health Africa, we are happy to be part of uh, this wonderful uh, network. And uh, I just want to give a, a small oversight in terms of uh, how malaria, I've, I've listened to some of the discussions at yesterday about uh, nutrition and how they affect uh, educational learning. Uh, but there's also one disease that basically uh, generally affects Africa, uh, and that is malaria next. Yeah, so it's just a brief about AMREF. Uh, AMREF Health Africa is, uh, is an organization that is based in Kenya, Nairobi. Uh, it has a global presence. Uh, currently, we are working in 35 countries in Africa, and of course, 11 in Europe and, uh, and North, North America. And basically, our role is to, to provide uh, technical advice to governments, uh, and specifically for malaria, working with the national malaria programs uh, to provide those technical advices in terms of uh, malaria interventions and control. Uh, but we also work with communities, especially the vulnerable communities in terms of uh, uh, lasting health change, looking for sustainable solutions in terms of improving the health outcomes. And we work closely with civil society organizations, community-based organizations to improve their health. Next. So when it comes to malaria, uh, I think malaria has been there since uh, before Christ and a lot has been said about it. And uh, if you look at uh, in, the, in the recent, in the recent uh, century, we most of the interventions and the tools that we use for malaria have generally targeted children under five. Uh, and, and out of course, pregnant women who are considered as the vulnerable populations when it comes to malaria. Uh, but what I'm trying to present here is basically a, a surveys and indicator surveys that have been done in the, in the recent across countries uh, with the highest burden of malaria. Uh, of course, uh, I, I believe you know that uh, some of the few countries, uh, Uganda, DRC, Nigeria, contribute to over 50% of the burden of malaria in Africa. Uh, but generally, it's also still sad that 90% of these cases and mortalities occur in this region. But what it basically tells you, and I don't want you to stick uh, on the numbers, but just to look at uh, uh, each and every country graph, and you can look at, at the end of it, the, the green color, the green bar, then you can see that it basically overshadows most of those other colors in terms of uh, th that basically is the prevalence of malaria. So this is the surveys that are done for children under five, but what we are currently seeing is a trend whereby uh, from, from basically back to the period of five years old, we are starting to see an increasing prevalence amongst children who are approaching the fifth birthday. And basically this is the age group that is basically being considered for most of the interventions uh, for malaria in Africa. However, it's critical to know that after five years, uh, what we are currently seeing is uh, basically a, a, a peak in terms of malaria prevalence. But most of the cases, especially above five years of old, are asymptomatic. What asymptomatic basically means is that we are having children above five years of old who basically have parastemia, which is a parasite in the blood, but they do not manifest symptoms of the disease. And this has the potential to, one, contribute to cognitive deficiency because these children would subsequently develop anemia, which could be hidden and it could not be very difficult to track and identify what are the causative agents for that. Uh, secondly, it basically compromises the elimination and the control efforts because these age groups consistently become uh, the agents for transmission, continued community transmission of malaria uh, in the communities. So basically, this is what this graph basically shows. Next. So in the last 10 years, there are a lot of, uh, quite a number of, uh, interesting uh, considerations in terms of the age groups. Uh, generally, uh, traditionally, six to 17 years of age were considered to be the school age going children, but now we are seeing a lot of transformations with, in Africa uh, based on the early childhood development education. We are seeing children from the age of three years starting to attend schools. And this has a significance in terms of affecting or influencing how these children will interact with their families. First, in Africa, when a child starts to be exposed to education, then the families tend to withdraw in terms of uh, assessing or determining the sleeping size and so forth and how they interact with other families. And basically that leads to what we call children being small adults, which is basically a very, very bad assumption in terms of how we are managing this kind of, these children. So a lot of evidence is coming out. And, and of course, for me, the most interesting one was from the Lancet, which is time for malaria control in the school age children because now we are seeing a potential where 
some of these efforts in terms of education and health are going to compromise much of the work that has been done in terms of malaria control and elimination. Next slide. So a typical village in Africa uh, looks like this. And of course, we are working towards universal healthcare where we are trying to promote uh, use of community health workers uh, in terms of reaching access to malaria services. And what has normally happened is that we'll have a central focal point, which is a primary health care facility, and we have community health workers who basically escalate some of those services to household levels. Uh, within that community, of course, we have private clinic, clinics. We are moving away from traditional clinics, uh, uh, bath attendants, and so forth and so on. Uh, we have uh, health management teams who basically provide oversight to, to those primary health care facilities. Uh, we have the referrals, so the network for referrals is much described well. However, when it comes to school, then that was one particular community that was previously ignored because schools also form part of that community. And what we are currently seeing is that most of the cases of that access care at primary health care facilities, if you go to any outpatient department of any facility, then you'll find that most of the clients or patients who basically are there are school aged children. So what are we doing to address that? So in the last four or five years, I think a lot of countries, especially across Africa, have developed innovative ways to actually involve schools. Uh, first, we also understand that teachers uh, can form a part of uh, uh, communications, uh, especially within uh, the community where they work. Uh, secondly, we are looking at issues around building the capacities of teachers. And this is quite happening across uh, most of the countries in Africa as we try to address the issues of knowledge, attitude, and practices. However, uh, much of the concern has come around uh, the use of children to be advocates for uptake of malaria interventions. Uh, for instance, in Kenya, we had a situation where uh, the communities, uh, the parents' associations, and uh, all the civil societies were not happy uh, by the fact that children were being used to basically promote uh, some of these health, health interventions at community level. Uh, secondly, it, it became a bit difficult to use uh, children and it's uh, difficult to basically uh, assess the impact of what the school children were doing in terms of promoting uh, malaria interventions, considering that they were working in a community where we also have community health volunteers. So what is happening is that countries are now adopting, uh, developing policies around school health to integrate with malaria. Uh, this is something that is developing uh, in Kenya, in Uganda, we are seeing uh, malaria programs closely working with the Ministry of Education, uh, Departments of Child and Adolescent Health, so that there's an integration of services at that particular level. Secondly, uh, every three to five years, most of the countries, especially in high transmission areas, will provide LLINs or ITNs for, for the communities. Now there's a consideration to basically consider the schools as part of the community for ITN targeting and uh, distribution. Uh, thirdly, is that uh, quite a number of countries, especially in areas where we have seasonal malaria, are adopting drug-based interventions where basically they can provide chemoprophylaxis at the beginning of the term or when the seasons are high for malaria so that basically the children can stay in schools and learn. Uh, so we hope uh, that uh, this platform also provides opportunities. Unfortunately, the funding for malaria program in schools is still low. Uh, I can give an example in Kenya, we are still working with Global Fund to, to basically consider funding uh, because we have a wider area that has malaria transmission. It's very low. Uh, I'm sorry to say this. Of late, we are only having around 20, 200,000 USD uh, for, for malaria interventions in school. But this is part of the advocacy work that we're doing to ensure. The WHO has already developed malaria behavioral uh, indicators, which we basically can use to assess some of these programs moving forward. Thank you. And back to you, Billy. OK, can I just come in there? Thank you so much, uh, Donald, for that. Uh... Um, that quick run through an extremely complicated program problem about how to address malaria as a school issue, not something that we've been addressing before. And now clearly we need to to get to grips with Bibi. Um, uh, we should have at this point Carol Karutu joining us from the um, the end fund. But I'm uh, I think the uh, the the gremlins have prevented that from uh, from happening. Oh, yeah. So. So, 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 Vivi, I'm going to I'm going to switch over now to introduce our next uh, uh, our next speakers, who who are the co-chairs of one of our other major communities of practice, and this is the Good Examples community of practice, um, which is aiming to look at 
uh, to create case studies on all of the all 73 of the member states that are part of the the coalition so i'm going to hand over now to uh, sorry i should also say these the, the, these co-chairs are co are sponsored by the governments of finland and by the government of france um, and this is part of a very of a growing um, community of practice across the world. So I'm going to ask Sylvie Avalon and uh, Heli Kusipalo to um, take us through the community of practice on good examples. Thank you very much, uh, Donald. Um, uh, we are very happy, um, Eli and I, to present you our community of uh, practice and it's uh, our, our first outcome. So we have a global purpose to share good practices among uh, the school meal coalition uh, uh, states. Next slide, please. And uh, to do so, we are uh, going to describe and catch, capitalize on national experience of implementing school meal program. We want to help formulate policy advice and to support new countries who would like to develop this kind of strategy in the future. And for the, from, from now, we are already including some countries, some expanding countries, uh, for example, Rwanda and uh, Malawi. We are already working on high income uh, programs uh, in Finland. France, Canada, and UK. And in the next months, we will uh, integrate also some large scale countries. Our community of practice is a voluntary network, and we have included two representatives per countries and also representatives from the World Food uh, Coalition and from OECD, particularly at the Food Sa System uh, Division. We have the support of several institutions like the Partnership for Child Development and the Rockefeller Foundation. And we have also several academic with us like the University of Malawi, the Aragri Network, and also a network of uh, French school feeding uh, institute who are working on uh, uh, school feeding like uh, IRD, CIRAD and INRAE. So next slide, please. We have developed a methodology to develop the case studies at national level. Uh, we will uh, collect information and primary data. And to do so, we have built a common template. Uh, this template uh, will uh, try to, uh, to make the list of all the indicators and the data that are available in existing reports in the Ministry of Agriculture, Education, Health Sector, etc. And with all this information, we will uh, uh, build uh, an historical background of a school meal program. Uh, the representative of a country will also uh, update the key uh, information on their country in terms of demography, education, food security, and health. And they will have to describe the school meal program in terms of design and implementation. We would like to know, for example, if the program are based on nutritional norms, on safety uh, norms too. We would like to know if uh, a specific food procurement is, uh, is uh, scheduled. Uh, do they prefer to source local food or not, for example? And uh, we will make uh, the analysis of the policy tools and the legal framework that are available at national level. And uh, we will also uh, see the data in terms of cost, coverage, and financing tools. As you know, monitoring and evaluation are very important because it allows us to see if a strategy is uh, efficient or not, and if it has an impact. So we will see uh, how the countries are monitoring and assessing their uh, school meal program. And with all this uh, information, we will formulate uh, the lesson we learn, and we will try to identify the best practices. All these elements will be available in the coming months on the website of the International Consortium. They will be dated uh, in the form of working paper, and uh, we will organize some communication through uh, events in the following uh, weeks. Uh, so now I let the floor to Eli Cusipalo, the co-chair of this community of practice. 
Eli. And next slide, please. I think she's here, but. So maybe I can uh, continue the presentation if she's not uh, with us. So we have already uh, developed a narrative at national level, and it's the first outcome of our community of practice. We have some team that are already built in uh, several countries, which means that we have like 15 people involved from research ministries and technical group. And uh, we, we have already a case study written for the Finnish uh, experience. And we are uh, currently working with a French uh, study, uh, the Canadian, British, and Rwandan case study too. Uh, this narrative will be uh, launched uh, with event, and you will uh, get the information of the website of the consortium. In the following uh, months, we would like to join on our efforts with the COP of analytic and metrics because they are currently working with 12 countries, among which there is uh, 10 African important countries, and we will, would like to develop uh, some, uh, some uh, narrative too. And we have a financial support already obtained from uh, NORAD, Rockefeller Foundation, but also USDA and IDRC. Next slide, please. And so uh, we, we had here a summary of uh, the, um, the Finnish uh, case study. But we know that they have a very uh, old uh, uh, program and that they have a developing uh, a strategy to improve uh, learning and uh, eating at, uh, at a student level. And they promote balanced, safe diet but also a sustainable diet and with a lot of uh, interesting approach. And we have already learned lessons from them, um, but uh, I won't describe more, more this, uh, this uh, slide because uh, I would prefer Ellie to do it, but I think she's not here. So next slide. <laughs> Thank you for your attention. And we are here to respond to your question. Donald, you're muted. Okay, Bibi, I didn't know whether you wanted to introduce uh, Edward, who is our uh, last speaker today. It looks like it looks like we've lost Heli somewhere in the system. She was there earlier on, um, and no doubt, uh, ho hopefully, she'll come before we before we before we wrap up. Inshallah. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sylvie, for the for explaining the good practices from the COP3. And uh, it's very interesting to see how many countries that have come on board to actually take part in this uh, initiative, which is very important at the level of uh, really getting to the ground, to the grassroots, these are the implementation. So thank you once again to you and Haley as the co-chairs and to the rest of your team. Now, let me introduce a friend that I've known for a while and is going to be uh, talking about um, Data and Monitoring Initiative, um, Edward Lloyd Evans, with uh, the, the Coalition of course on Data and Monitoring. And we've already started this uh, initiative in a number of countries. We, we had a chance to present it in Botswana a few weeks ago, but he has more information around which countries are there. So without further ado, Edward, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Bibi, um, and a good day to all of you. I'm delighted to be here with you uh, to share some exciting work, as uh, Bibi has indicated, that we're engaged in with the research consortium from a data and monitoring uh, standpoint. So, so let me just start by saying, we've heard on this conversation, on, in this, in this uh, discussion here today, we've heard from uh, uh, Betsy Elizabeth Christensen, um, who's spoken to us about the emerging findings that, that are coming out of the, the Cochrane reviews. So, so how are we going to use such evidence, uh, such robust evidence? We, we, we see something like 40,000 records uh, being evaluated um, and records going back to 1911. That, that's just uh, fascinating to me um, on school meals, school health and nutrition. Um, so the data and monitoring initiative, one of its core outputs is 
the flagship state of school feeding uh, publication. And that publication, which is published every two years by the World Food Program, is the official reporting mechanism of the data and monitoring initiative to the School Meals Coalition. This is the publication that basically tells governments who have put this uh, coalition together how we are doing against the three objectives of the School Meals Coalition. How are we doing against the 370 million children that um, were being fed before COVID? How are we doing against the, children, the 73 million children who were not feeding? And how are we doing in programs and policies overall? So this uh, publication will have evidence from the Cochrane Review to talk about what those findings are um, as, as we go forward. So, so that's one core way that uh, the Data and Monitoring Initiative is working with uh, the Research Consortium. The Research Consortium, as you know, is uh, leading that community of practice on impact and evidence. And, and so um, some of these findings we're actually going to be using in the, the Data and Monitoring Initiative as, as an output in the, in the State of School Feeding uh, worldwide publication uh, that's produced every two years and it's published in seven languages. Another uh, item we heard um, on this, in this call is on LAYS, the Learning Adjusted Years of, of Schooling. Not only is, is it about education, but we've heard that how do you measure um, for, for education what the actual child of, um, children are learning. So the, the findings out of that, um, the, the community of practice around analytics and metrics, the two co-chairs, uh, we heard from Stefan Dranguet yesterday on the value for money uh, studies. We've heard from uh, Noam Angrist on LAYS today, identifying those uh, pieces of, of, of data that come out of those studies, capturing them and making them available as quality indicators and metrics um, in the data monitoring initiative is only going to help better decision-making and also um, inform policies uh, and, and, and assist governments in, in designing better programs, school meals, school health and nutrition programs for these learners. Um, the third item we just heard from uh, uh, on this call that we're working um, with very closely uh, with the research consortium again, is this area of good practices that Sylvie uh, highlighted and it's unfortunate Heli uh, couldn't join. But um, there are 12 country uh, case studies that are being done on value for money studies. Uh, Bibi just highlighted, um, she spoke to the SADC region um, just a couple of weeks ago about um, what are the returns. We've seen a desk review that shows that for every dollar you invest in school meals, you return about nine, up to nine dollars uh, across at least four sectors, health, agriculture, education, and social protection. We're doing these 12 country studies uh, now for value for money in those countries to get more uh, uh, in-depth uh, data in, in the, the several countries that were, were, were highlighted. Um, and then the case studies, uh, country states that case studies and um, uh, that um, still be indicated was capturing these best practices, capturing these case studies from the OECD, from BRICS countries, these large countries, from these African countries, so that we share with governments and partners through the data and monitoring initiative. Um, because the data and monitoring initiative, as um, I'm, I'm gonna invite you to a session on Friday, uh, the 14th at 125 uh, CET um, to find out more about this initiative. But it will highlight how all these evidence, all these indicators and, and, and data that we're getting will be used to one, um, and I'm gonna now talk about how the data and monitoring initiative will help to improve and institutionalize the availability of quality data on national school meal programs worldwide. And this will help evidence-based decision, decision making and also help us in tracking and reporting on progress. Again, this is an initiative that supports all the other initiatives of the, the coalition. The research consortium, it supports uh, advocacy, it supports the sustainable financing initiative, the peer-to-peer -peer learning and, um, and advocacy as I, as I indicated. So what, what is this about? It's, it's really about uh, one, coming up with established 
core set of indicators and definitions, methodologies, that is, for how we report on read. Secondly, um, it, it also looks at defining and coming up with a set of processes, establishing a set of processes for better data collection, data validation, analysis, and reporting, and enabling governments to systematically capture this information and report high quality data back into a database. We do not have today a central database, a UN database that electronically captures, uh, stores, curates, and makes available and accessible in time national school meals information globally. So, so this is all what the research consortium is helping us pull together in these communities of practice, as well as the work that we're doing um, in the, in the um, data monitoring initiative to address these three things. How do we come up with core set of, of, of indicators? Yesterday on the calls, we've heard about how the data is lacking, how the data is poor uh, in a lot of these uh, developing countries. How do we make sure we look at this from a systems uh, perspective, enable capacity, enable the resources, and look at all the, 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 the gaps. And we have three working groups addressing indicators, addressing processes and systems, and addressing the issue of a database. And so um, we have a structure. I'll talk more about this on Friday. So I kindly invite you to join us um, on Friday at 1.25 uh, Central uh, CET, uh, Rome time, that is, um, to find out more about this exciting body of work. But this uh, opportunity I've had just to thank you uh, to the research consortium for the work that we have been involved in in uh, the communities of practice on uh, case studies, on uh, analytics and metrics, and on uh, impact and evidence. Bibi, I thank you, and I, I turn back over to you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Edward. I think at this point, I shall turn over to Dawn to lead us not into temptation, but to... <laughs> <laughs> well, well, we'll see about that. The, uh... This is uh, this is great, and thank you so much, uh, Edward, for uh, for tell it, for reminding us that on Friday that both of the other initiatives, the data monitoring initiative that you lead, and also the the uh, sustainable financing initiative that we heard about, we heard from Veronique about yesterday, both of those will be uh, presenting on Friday. So if you want to hear more about those initiatives, that's the time. Now I think we we have now got Heli Kusipalo back online. Um, Kate, can we can we go back to the slides for the um, the good practices? Um, that's it. And I think let's go to the Finland. I think that is the Finland slide. So Heli, if you're if you can, if you're now connecting with us, perhaps you could just talk us through um, the the uh, case study from Finland. Just a few minutes. Don, unfortunately, I'm looking through our panelists and I can't see Heli again. I think we might have lost her. You think we've lost her again? I can't see her yet. OK. All right, then in that case, um, I think it then, then hand, we now hand over. We'll see what happens. And uh, so that's a shame we have missed out on Heli and on Carol from uh, who had been phoning in from Nairobi. Um, but otherwise, I think I want to say what a what a really a really good meeting uh, this has been. Some very good in in very instructive um, examples during the course of of uh, this session. I think we can go to the um, uh, uh, to the to the final part, which is just really for us to uh, to wrap up on this. And from Bibi will come in on, in a moment. Um, but I just wanted to say that the in particular, please remember. That we have now written this statement about the insights gained that the research consortium's sense of the main insight uh, insights gained um, um, and that that's on the website and I think in the chat there's a um, uh, uh, there's there's the way to find the uh, that text and also how to provide feedback on that text and and we've sent that text out to the the 73 uh, governments, the parliamentarians, and the policy makers um, that are part of the uh, that are running the coalition, and we will get back from uh, from them their feedback next week when we have the ministerial meeting in in Helsinki. So any guidance you can give, 
would be helpful. And we will use that to try and uh, guide our thinking through uh, in the next next year of the role of the research consortium. So please feel free to uh, to write in and, and give us your give us your feedback. Um, BB, I'm going to just hand over to you. I think the team are still looking to see if we can reconnect with Heli. OK. OK, thank you very much, Dawn. And thank you once again, Edward. Um, I was just wondering, Dawn, if we have, if we can take uh, two or three burning questions because we've uh, a few minutes just to do that before. Great, before great idea. Have, yeah. Can we see the questions on the chat? Who would like to pose a question? Or anybody? I'm not seeing any hand. specific specific one. Can I just actually turn it over to Sylvie to ask the question? If if Heli had been here, do you know that if there was anything very particular that she wanted to to emphasize? Well, I think she wanted to emphasize the fact that uh, they have uh, developed a long term uh, school meal program, uh, which is based on inclusion of all the, the children and uh, it is uh, sustainable uh, uh, in terms of uh, climate, uh, diet diversity and social inclusion. And so they have formulated their, um, their uh, lesson learned and they will uh, organize uh, in the following weeks an event to share all this uh, information with us. Excellent. Thank you very much indeed. And I want to address a question now to, to uh, Donald Apat, Dr. Apat from uh, AMREF. Um, so we understand that WHO has just changed its guidance to encourage treatment of, of malaria in school-aged children. Could you just tell us a little bit about uh, what that change, what that change actually means? Yeah, thank you, Don. Uh, and, and this is part of uh, uh, what we're talking about when you look at uh, the drug-based uh, interventions. And uh, the, uh, this is basically will be referred to as uh, intermittent preventive treatment for school-going children. And, and this basically uh, works, uh, especially uh, like from my previous uh, the, uh, the presentation was on uh, seasonality. Uh, uh, we have uh, children, especially in, in seasonal transmission areas, who basically uh, are at risk of basically uh, getting malaria, and, and this will basically contribute to, to, to uh, absenteeism and, and other factors that are associated with, uh, with learning. Uh, so yes, the guidance is there, uh, but uh, I think countries are also trying to, to internalize because, you know, when W2 guidelines are developed, then it's up to countries to, to basically assess that guidance and see uh, whether uh, it's feasible for them to implement. And, and that is part of what is happening, especially in East Africa. We are seeing uh, quite a number of uh, piloting of, of, of these kind of interventions happening to see whether uh, even in routine, especially in areas where malaria is perennial, uh, then uh, children, school-going children will basically receive some form, form of chemotherapy to help them basically uh, stay in school uh, because uh, some of these areas are highly, highly transmissible for malaria and, uh, and actually affects this group of children. So we are happy with the WHO recommendations and uh, we look forward uh, to basically work with countries to, to see whether they can pilot and actually implement and that is going to take some time. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. And I, I think that you've, you and others have been trying for some, actually for some decades to get some clarity in terms of WHO guidance for school-aged children. The school-aged children have been kind of left out of the, the malaria program to some extent uh, um, with right. a focus, well, quite rightly, with a focus on very young children who are at risk of dying. I, I, can, I, I can see that. But I think this is a new picture um, and, and we can see some real progress here. Congratulations to AMREF for all their work in that. Um, Bibi, did you uh, want to raise a question or shall we, or would you like no, to wrap just, up? Um, just to run a little bit of commentary to buttress what Donald just said. I mean, indeed, malaria pre prevalence is a problem in Africa, may maybe not just in Africa, but, you know, personally, having lived in, a, in East Africa, in Tanzania, for more than six years, I know the extent to which malaria can be very debilitating, you know, for young children, for mothers, for the whole family alike because it also puts a strain on the health systems. So I very much liked how he approached, you know, 
and emphasize the importance of primary health care so that you know people can have the first you know port of call as the you know local clinic before they go to the secondary and tertiary system. So thank you for that. And then I was just wondering if and how Donald, you are engaging the media to help you transmit uh, some messages around malaria prevention and mitigation and uh, yeah. That's great. And I think what you give me an opportunity there to say is of course, let's remember we're the research consortium. We're the, we're the ones that try and, and highlight the issues that we've, that we've not managed to uh, address uh, properly so far. That's our, our main role. We hope that by giving great feedback to parliamentarians and policymakers in the countries, that that will also then turn out to influence the way in which programs are, are implemented. And it's, you know, the phrase we've been using is, we're a network of networks. And those networks include the real doers like AMREF, the people who are and, and uh, end fund, the people who go out and actually um, uh, help, help the children very directly. Okay, guys, well, I'm afraid time as usual has caught up with us. Um, I think, uh, you know, sadly, we don't have Carol uh, on, uh, on the call, but we'll, we'll try and rectify that in the future. We're, we're very happy that the end fund, that the neglected tropical disease area, which treating hundreds of millions of children in schools on a regular basis, is now also part of this big network that we're, we're trying to grow. We hope all of you who are on this call will be, be also part of that network. And we hope you'll join our mail, our mail list and, and be, be part, be, be an active part of how we move forward. We're always looking for new members and new participants in the communities of, of practice. Mm -hmm. So I think it remains, uh, um, I think we've, we've, we've got a, a, a message in the chat about how you can sign up to, to achieve that. So I think Bibi, Thank you to you. It's great, always being great being a partner with you on these uh, on, on these <laughs> events. Let's 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 thank do this more frequently. <laughs> but let us thank let us thank the uh, the great team we had to to today: Betsy, um, Sylvie, Helly, Donald, Edward, um, and 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 Carol, who we know was trying very hard, and Noam, who joined us uh, through a video. Thank you all for uh, making this such a uh, a marvelous uh, session and, and, and showing the, the real sense of networking. Dawn, and to the participants and to the interpreters without whom we could have not been able to, to have this session. So thank you all and have a lovely rest of the a week. And uh, we hope to see you at the next sessions related to the research consortium. Perfect. And we have three, so there's three sessions tomorrow that we've been encouraging you to, to join. They're all listed on the, on the website. And then, of course, the two initiative sessions on Friday. Of course, all the sessions are interesting, but those are, those are ones we've picked out. OK, take care. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you all. Thank you all. And have a lovely afternoon.